Good morning and welcome to the Church of the Holy Comforter on this ninth Sunday following the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, this Sunday begins a five-week foray uh, into the Gospel of John. Uh, we depart from the story of Mark as we've been hearing mostly uh, throughout this uh, year B as we call it in this lectionary cycle. Uh, but for the next five weeks we're going to be uh, planning ourselves. Uh, in the sixth chapter of John, hearing lots of stories uh, about bread. Begins today with the feeding of the 5,000, as we often hear it, or as many have called it, it's the multiplication of the loaves and fish. After this Sunday, we'll have four Sundays in which we get to explore uh, the meaning behind this wonderful miracle, uh, the words that Jesus says that basically are the words that were the inspiration to one of our most beloved hymns, I Am the Bread of Life, Hymn 335. So while we're going to get fed with lots of bread, we do hope that it sustains you during these dog days of summer. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness, and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Epistle to the Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. of sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table and come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure.
Lift up your face, O wanderer, come, O oh, you are not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you There's joy for the morning, O oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each one of our hearts be always acceptable to our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
the multiplication of the loaves and fish, the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only one of Jesus' miracles that's recorded in all four Gospels. So it's an incredibly important story. And we've probably heard that story so many times we almost know it by heart. Over the years, I've heard really two different interpretations for this miracle. The first, and maybe the most familiar, is that Jesus defied the laws of nature to produce enough food to feed 5,000 people from just five loaves of bread and two fish. And we might think of this as a magical interpretation, where something happens that's physically impossible. Well, miracles like this, they're, they're all over the Bible. The parting of the Red Sea, manna falling from heaven to feed the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years, Jesus changing water into wine or raising Lazarus from the dead. The second interpretation is, is that the people who went out to see Jesus in a deserted place did what we would do if we were headed to a, a concert or someplace a day at the beach, perhaps. You go there with a, a picnic lunch, maybe something in your backpack. But you've packed your own food, enough to maybe feed yourself and your family. But when the hour grew late and it was time to eat, no one wanted to bring out their picnic lunch, lest they would have to share with anybody who was unprepared and end up with not enough food for themselves. And then all of a sudden, there's one little boy seeing a need steps forward to share what his family has brought. I imagine his mother frantically trying to call him back. No, that's our food. Don't give it away. And yet he does. And his generosity inspires the crowd to share theirs as well. That's a miracle. In other words, it's a miracle of scarcity and selfishness transformed into generosity and abundance. It's a metaphorical miracle, if you will. Now, this interpretation might seem a little weak, certainly not as impressive as feeding 5,000 people out of thin air. Well, five loaves, two fish, but you get my point. But when you consider the power of tribalism, the forces that encourage us to care for our own first before we dare look after anybody else, well, the second interpretation is actually quite powerful. So which interpretation do we pick? Magic or metaphor? You know, if we call it a metaphorical miracle, we don't have to wrestle with whether we believe in science to find supernatural feats. We can dig deep into the force that transforms human hearts and behavior and look for ways to kind of replicate that in our own society, rather than fretting over whether God's still in the miracle business. But if we do that, we possibly lose something. The hope, the hope that comes with worshiping a God who's able to overturn any obstacle we faced, no matter how seemingly impossible. If you ever prayed for a loved one who's got stage four cancer to somehow reverse itself, or for your child to be okay despite a terrible accident, you know how powerful that kind of hope can be. If we call it a magical miracle, on the other hand, we get to embrace this God who defies our understanding and goes beyond human limits. The God who makes a, a way out of no way that can be deeply comforting. We also get to embrace the narrative that all these miracle stories tell. And it's namely this that God is a God who provides for God's people no matter what, never runs out of sustenance, freedom, health, or hospitality. God who shares all these things willingly, even lavishly with us, whether we deserve it or not. You know, there's a reason that there are 12 baskets full of crumbs left after everyone who's had their fill. The message is that this God, this Jesus never runs out always has more than enough to go around. You know, in these days, when seas no longer part, bread no longer falls from heaven, 
Does embracing the magical interpretation leave us full of false hope? Does it leave us bitter and angry at God for not curing us of a terminal illness or saving our children from heartbreak or harm, since God has so clearly done so many times in the past? It's a tough question. And here's another one. Do we really have to choose one interpretation over the other? We don't have to be binary thinkers. Is it magic or is it metaphor? I don't know. But you know, if we can find our way to actually embracing both the magic of miracle and the metaphor of miracle, then when it comes to the miraculous, we'll find ourselves submerged in a far more interesting challenge than intellectual arguments for and against. We'll find ourselves wondering how we can take inspiration from the divine to affect a transformation with our own two hands. Ask anybody who's ever thought that they've been the beneficiary of a miracle, and I guarantee you they've tried to do something with that. Because after all, Jesus didn't immediately multiply the loaves and fishes to produce a huge mountain of food in front of a hungry crowd, though he really could have. Instead, to accomplish his miracle, he worked through a little boy, a child that stepped forward he used the passing of food from one set of human hands to another. And in that way, each person there participated in the incredible miracle, whether it was magic or metaphor. It was a miracle of no one going hungry and absolutely everybody having enough. There's a great story by Quaker author, author Parker Palmer, tells about an unusual experience he had once while flying. I know flying, it's not always uh, the most fun thing to do, and it wasn't for this one. He writes, after a speech in Saskatchewan, I boarded a 6 a.m. flight from home to Wisconsin. Our departure was delayed because the truck that brings coffee to the planes had broken down. After a while, the pilot said, well, we're gonna take off without the coffee. We wanna get you from to Detroit on time. He goes on to say, I was up front where all the road warriors sit, a surly tribe, especially at that hour. They began griping loudly and at length about incompetence, lousy service, you know the drill. Once we got into the air, the lead flight attendant came to the center of the aisle with her mic and said, I know you're upset about the coffee. And then there was a dramatic pause. Well, get over it. Start sharing stuff with your seatmates. That bag of peanuts you got on your last flight and put in your pocket, we'll tear it open, pass them around. You got gum, you have mints, we'll share them. You can't read all the sections of your newspaper at once. Offer them to others. Show the pictures of your kids and grandkids. You've got them in your wallets. And as she went on in that vein, a miracle happened. People began laughing doing what she told them to do. A surly scene turned into a summer camp. An hour later, as the seat attendant passed by my seat, Palmer says, I signaled to her, said, you know, what you did was really amazing. Where can I send a letter of commendation? Thanks, she said, I'll get you a form. And then she leaned down and she whispered into Palmer's ear, you know, the loaves and the fishes aren't dead. Friends, whether you tend to take miracle at face value, or you look for a more down-to-earth explanation, or maybe a little bit of both, let us, each and every one of us, find a way to follow Jesus' lead and keep miracles alive, even with our own two hands.
breathe again past the word around those above Christ is able to make us one at his table he sets the tone teaching people to live to bless love in word and in deed express Jesus lives again earth can breathe again We pray, living God, speak to us in the place where we are today and make your presence known. Speak to us the words of affirmation that we may know that we are loved by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, speak to us in the place where we are today, even in the face of darkness. Speak to the uncertainty of our times and reassure us that you hold the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, speak to us in the place where we are today and bring hope for days to come. Speak words of comfort and of healing and words of compassion for those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, speak to us in the place where we are today, that we might speak a word for our times. Speak into the future that lies before us and grant us a grace as we seek to live out that future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, speak to us in the place where we are today, that we might hear again your voice. Speak to us on the highest heights and in the deepest depths that we may know and be known by the one whom you love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we lift up to you all these prayers using the words that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and burn in your hearts forevermore. Amen. Holy people of God, let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.